Hello everyone, this is one of the few videos that we will do in English, but this is for a very good reason. We are commenting here the potential Sericas acquisition with Jeremy Raper. Hi, Jeremy. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks, Copy. I love the intro. That was amazing. Well, the <laughs> intro, I must say, that is from a really pro guy called Oscar Araujo, that he did it for us like one, one week ago or two weeks ago, and it's just another level, to be honest. That was great. I thought I was watching a scene from Margin Call. <laughs> Makes yeah, me want to go out and buy some stocks. <laughs> okay, so I have with me Jeremy Raper. You can see the details on the on the screen. So he's a really well known in investor, and you know we have been sharing some other ideas before, like Caspi, for example, and and others like Mediaset. And now we are here in the middle also with Sharika. So before we start, just to remember that we are not giving here any kind of investment advice at all you know so all the content that mm -hmm. you can see in momentum the reason that we are doing is more for educative purposes than to give any any kind of advice to anybody so please do your own research and now with that jeremy i just put the first slide here this is the beginning you sent a letter to the uh, chairman of serica so you can start with mm -hmm. your views and we can we can start commenting Certainly, certainly. And again, thanks for having me, uh, Kapi, and thank you for providing this forum to discuss the important issues that I believe, that I guess we both believe exist with this potential transaction. Um, so, so yes, I mean, I'm sure many of your uh, followers and, and others who may see this have seen the letter I sent to the board. Um, I feel it summarizes kind of the, the main reasons I I think the the most important uh, thing to take away from from the um, from the letter, the very headline is: whenever you make a transaction like this, whenever an executive team contemplates a transformational deal such as this, you need to separate two things. That is, you need to put to one side the potential strategic rationale and think about that in its own context, but you also need to consider the price. Because there is no deal that is so strategic and so smart that can make up for a terrible price. And I think that's an, an a bad structure, but, but essentially the, the price you pay. Um, similarly, there's no deal that is bad enough um, were the price to be low enough that it would not be a great purchase. So I think those are the two most important questions that you need to think about that anyone really trying to assess this deal needs to think about. Is the price being paid for the potential upside reasonable? not just on its own accord, but also relative to any other potential use for Serica's excess cash. Because ultimately, Serica right now is, you know, 65% of its market cap or valuation is, is explained by the net cash on its balance sheet. And so very little value has been given by the market to the operating business. And so when you make a transaction where you transfer essentially all or the vast majority of that excess cash for another set of assets, you completely change the risk profile going forward. Um, so it's very, very important to understand, okay, are we getting paid enough for that transfer of value from a very hard, you know, cash, cash at 100%, you know, it's pretty easy to value. Um, and then turning that into an operating asset that has its own that has its own risk. So at a very high level, I would I would, you know, consider anyone who's interacting with the company or reading what the company puts out, yeah, it's all very well and good to think of it as a strategic acquisition or to understand the potential upside from acquiring the tailwind business. But that has to be set against the context of, of what you're paying for it. And when you're paying for it largely in your own shares of the trade at one time's earnings, I mean, that's where I have a real problem with the transaction. Yeah, and, so that's and kind of, one that, of the yeah, things that's kind that of a very headline. Go on, go on, go on. Yeah. yeah, one of the things that I put there in red, you can see is about the governance. Because for me, this is just another example of poor governance that you know in uk there are so many companies it's like a, a mine landing you know 
UK, UK stocks. And this is yet another one, you know, where, where the governance is so poor, in my view, you know, about the deal, as you said, the way that they are structuring the deal, how they rejected one from Kistos, that it was way more money, you know, just yep. almost yep. six months ago, how they are doing that in a RAS. And you know that one of the main reasons is that in three, four weeks, I think, or in a month, uh, Kistos could be betting again, you know, and, and providing another yes. offer. So they are doing this in a RAS, so they cannot do that. Because imagine that yes. they would wait for a month and then Kistos is coming with a way better offer. What is gonna do the board? You know, so yes, it's, actually, it's, it's actually stunning, much. It's honestly. much. It's much. Yes, sorry to cut in, but you're right. You're right. I mean, the Kistos transaction. So, so to give people some history, in case no one is not everyone is familiar with the history, but in July, late July last year, Kistos offered uh, 213 pence in cash and a 58 percent stake in the Proform merged entity. Right, so it was almost a merger of equals, but Serica would have acquired majority. So if you're an existing shareholder of Serica, you would have had more of the combined company, but you also would have got 213 pence in cash out. Now, at the time, Kistos shares were trading higher than they are today. The implied value was around 425, 430 pence a share. Even today, well, actually, Kistos stock went down a little bit yesterday, so I'm not sure what happened there, but. Even today, the implied price is well, 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 well north of 278 pence, which was the theoretical price at which they're issuing new shares to Mercuria as part of this transaction. So you touch on a number of interesting points there, Kapi, with regard to governance. So at the time, uh, Serica board rejected the Kistos offer, saying that the bid, quote unquote, significantly undervalues Serica. Now, as part of that deal, Kistos would have assumed a lar largely management control and a number of members of the board today at Serica, including, I believe, Mitch Flegg, the CEO, would no Mitch Flegg would not have been the CEO of the combined exactly. company. Exactly. Right? The main difference we between the two deals is just that, you know, that with the deal on Kistos, basically Andrew would be running the company and the current yes. management in Serica, they are out, you know. And exactly. now with this deal with Mercuria, they are giving the control of the company. They don't care at all about providing the control with the only difference that they just want to stay there, you know? So what is the difference between the two deals? One of the key ones is that with the Kistos one, the shareholders are clearly getting more, but the management of Serica is out. With the Mercuria yes. one, the shareholders are clearly getting less, but the management is continue getting the money every year. That's absolutely right. And it's worth mentioning that management at Serica, uh, outside of the chairman. So the chairman of Serica, Mr. Craven Walker, does own a significant piece. He owns, I think, about 2% of the company. But everyone else on the board. So Mitch Flegg owns 180,000 shares. Okay, so I personally own, you know, eight, nine times more than Mr. Flegg. And there's many other individual shareholders who own more than Mr. Flegg. So you could argue, as you said, that the vast majority of the extant Serica board outside the chairman, admittedly the chairman has a large personal stake, but outside the chairman, every other executive of the company has a far greater interest in maintaining their position and the kind of salary, the compensation, the benefits that come with that than seeing the best outcome for shareholders. So it's interesting, right, in assessing this deal, and we can go through it in some detail, like whenever you see a large transaction like this, like it's always worth asking, okay, how did this deal come about, right? Because what you really want whenever some company buys another company or there's a, there's a big merger, you want all factors to be considered. So we're talking a lot about this Kistos deal just because it was so recent and it was rejected. And as you said, the value argument is very plain to see, right? You merge with another company, you grow production just like you would have do with this Tailwind deal. But instead of issuing shares at 278, you get shares worth 425 and take out a lot of your cost. So it's a huge price differential. But irrespective of that, the idea is you want to access all options, right? So you run, a, you run a full strategic process, you run an auction essentially, and you see what the best outcome is. Now, whether that means you're a buyer or a seller, that depends on what the market offers you, right? And, and uh, as you said about governance, the, the uh, fiduciary duty of the board is to examine all options and to decide upon the one that maximizes shareholder value. That's just plain and simple. Um, and so it's very clear to me in this situation, that's exactly what they did not do um, because the consideration and the structure of this deal is so woefully inadequate that any number of obvious options, whether it be the Kistos deal or simply a recapitalization where they 
you know, tender for a huge amount of the shares and buy back their own shares creates a whole lot more value, obviously, um, yep. for, for shareholders. So it's clear they didn't consider all options. So it would be very interesting to figure out how this deal came about. But of course, we're not given that context yep. because this is, not, this is not the US where they actually have to file a proxy and explain exactly how the deal came about. As you probably know, in the US, when you have a merger document in the proxy, there's a very detailed section where they explain all the steps of negotiation between the buyer and the seller, you know, the going back and forth, how the deal came about here, and especially for an AIM listed stock, there's no detail. It was a 20 page circular of which 10 pages with definitions and rep- repetitions. There was almost no detail on the transaction at all. So look, they did a deal to entrench themselves to build an empire. Um, and one that may or may not be accretive depending on your assumptions, um, but is certainly with a fair amount of risk. And they did this deal in a sub in a substandard structure and in a subordinating structure at a terrible price when your own equity trades its cents on the dollar. That part yeah. is unforgivable. And that's what we should probably focus on. Yeah, and I'm going through the different points on your letter. So the first one is what I have on the screen, that basically yep. what you are saying is that the proposed combination is incinerating shareholder value so in order to so that what you are saying is that the money that they are paying and of course what you need to consider here is what you are paying is how much you are paying plus how much is the debt of the company you know so why yes. this is so important here well it's always important but here even more because tailwind is a company that is way leveraged so they have debt yes. there and Seric, on the other hand, is a company with so much cash, you know, probably is, is something that is very rare, you know, because I don't think that there are many companies or if any in the North Sea that they have like 60 or 70 percent of their market cap in in cash, you know. So, of course, right. you need to value things on, on enterprise value. Right. So That's going right. to the reserves, uh, if you just do some math. Here, some quick numbers. You have that the money that you are paying for Tailwheel is around twenty dollars per barrel of those yes. uh, two P reserves. But if yes. you are doing the same with the Serica, you know, two uh, P reserves itself is six dollars uh, per barrel. So you are seventy percent discounted for the price that you are paying for Tailwind, right? That's right, and I, I would emphasize. One additional point, it's not just that you're paying $20 a barrel for proven reserves whilst your own currency trades at $6 a barrel, your implied valuation of your company, as you said, on an enterprise value basis. It's that you're actually selling shares actively at that $6 a barrel, right? Because you're paying for half of that 700 million pound total cost. Half of it is coming in shares. So think of it as you're selling, actually it's 52%. 52% of the total acquisition price to Serica is being paid in their own currency trading at $6 a barrel. So they're actively selling new shares at $6 a barrel to buy something at $20 a barrel. That's what I mean when I say you're immediately incinerating value because even if this acquisition were to perform wildly ahead of expectations and create a lot of value, that value flow through to current Serica shareholders would be severely handicapped by the very fact that you're issuing so many new shares to the tailwind guys, the tailwind sellers. So the benefit of that accretion is going overwhelmingly to the guys who buy the new shares, not not extant Serica shareholders. And the board of Serica's responsibility is not the guys they bring into the tent. It's people like you and I who already own shares. Um, So that's why it's such a, such a silly and um, financially ludicrous transaction, right? If they were just taking their excess cash, okay. And they were just using only their excess cash to buy at $20 a barrel. You could at least make the argument that, okay, well, our shares are undervalued, but we think buying this company, even at $20 a barrel is going to create a lot more value because it's going to re-rate us. It's going to give us more scale. There's all these hidden synergy. You know, you could make some kind of argument, but when you then go and issue 30% of the pro forma cap structure, at said low, low, low price amongst, I think it's the lowest independent valuation on an EV2P basis in listed UK mid caps. I think it is um, out, outside of one name, which is a Kurdistan asset. So there's a company, there's a company called Shamaran Resources, which trades at $3 a barrel or something, but that's all in Kurdistan and the Kurdistan government never pays them. So, yeah. you know, for companies in the North Sea with assets in the North Sea and a, and a decent regulatory regime, this is just the craziest valuation. And, you know, 
it would be far, far less risky with zero operational risk and simply a matter of, of capital allocation being better to, to retire your own shares at this very low valuation or close enough, um, as opposed to buying a whole suite of new assets, creating a, a new shareholder who has effective control of the company. We'll talk about that shortly. Um, uh, uh, instead of, of doing that, you could you could find so many other ways to accrete value to shareholders that this is by far and away the worst the worst of these options. Yeah, and, and, and it's clear, you know, as as you can see here on the screen, not only the reserves, but also in terms of the barrels that they will pr be producing per day. Again, the money that you are paying is just too much, right? I mean, like when your enterprise value is 300 million and you have 25,000 barrels and you are buying something for more than 700 million, that is 18 to 20,000 barrels is just... The numbers are not there, right? And and I guess that one of the things that people that is supporting the deal are saying is that uh, you have all those tax losses, you know, that you need to take into account. And, and yeah. I think it's true that you need to take those into account. But the thing is, like, it's not that simple, right? Because the thing is, like, uh, first of all, is not just putting all the money there that you have for those tax losses to use it like in the first year you you have like three different buckets and you have some money for each of them so it can be a point where you are using for example for a year the full thing but on the other two you cannot do it and then the second thing that i raise here is that it is very likely in my view that and and i know that because i I live in, in London, you know, I'm even a British citizen now, so I know very well the politics here. And it is yep. very likely that next year the uh, the Labour Party will be in, in government, you know, so uh, they are really, really against oil and gas, as, as we know, yes. and probably something that is going, you know, like farther instead of less. So we don't even have a certainty that the same regime that we have now in terms of using those tax losses, we will use it in the future. So I'm not going to say that that amount that they have on tax losses is uh, nothing. I, I think there is a value, but for sure it's not the value that they are implying now because there is uncertainty on that. So for sure you need to apply a discount there. I totally agree. I, I didn't mention the tax loss issue in my letter because it is quite complex and you have to make a lot of speculative assumptions. So in my letter, I'm purely talking about the numbers, which are all on paper, which are all basically disclosed by the company and which are very easy to, to, to analyze and unpack. Your points are mostly correct or entirely correct. The total amount of tax losses that theoretically will come with the deal in terms of gross aggregate value is 470 million pounds. As you said, you can't enjoy all that immediately. Even in the best case where you could enjoy full 470 million value, it would take a number of years to, ex to, to, to extinguish that value, to work through it. So you'd have to NPV it over a number of years. Let's say best case prices hold in according to management's, management's estimates. It would take call it three years, two to three years. So you'd have to NPV that 470. So already that 470 goes down to what, 350 or something, let's say. Now, labor coming in next year. You'll notice that on the call discussion, discussing this transaction, on the very first call, they said almost little, almost nothing about the tax losses. They would not make a, an official comment when asked as to whether they thought um, they could use all these full tax losses. They said they're still doing the work on that. Then on the second call, after a few shareholders, such as myself and yourself and others, had talked negatively about the transaction, they included that slide on the taxes, and Mitch on the call said we think we'll be able to get full value out of the losses. But of course, he made similar comments. We don't know what the political future holds. I'm in total agreement with you. I think it's absolutely ridiculous if you give anything close to full value for those losses, um, because on the tax assets, I should say, because Labor comes in next year. This is a massive political football they're kicking around, oil and gas. The entire rationale for this transaction at this point rests upon dodging the excess profits levy. This tax tax issue here is basically a way to get around the excess profits levy. All you're doing is setting up a situation where some labor politician who wants to score a point will put a massive red circle around Serica and say, look, this is what's wrong with the excess profits levy. They're using a tax loophole to get out of paying the taxes um, that the conservative government put in. So why yeah, don't and, we just this create is so a new easy. section or yeah, it's so I easy mean, I, to, to I know how the politics screw, work here. It's so yeah. easy to go into the BBC and say, "Look, this is sell that have been, you know, without paying, you know, using this this tax uh, 
thing, you know, they have not been paying three billion in the last four years. We need to stop that. You know, they are making so much money, you know. So when they will change things, of course, sell at the end. They don't care, you know, because they they are doing billions and billions, you know. But the problem is for the Sericas and for the Kistos, you know, that they, they don't have a way to escape from here. And one thing that we will comment later, you know, but it's funny, you know, that in the past months they have been saying that they, the North Sea is looking really bad and they would be by something outside North Sea. And then they mm-hmm. come with a transaction in the North Sea, you know. But let's go for the next point that i have here that sure. for me this is so so important you know so basically it's not only that the numbers are not good in my view i shared that with you but yep. that you are providing or you are giving away the control of the company but yes. mercury in this case that they are taking the control of serica they are not paying any premium at all so which for me it's so crazy this is, this is really key. This is something that doesn't show up in the numbers, but it is just as important, if not more important, as you suggested. So in the UK, the most common way a company can be acquired is by what's called a scheme of arrangement, SIA, whereby a company will enter a transaction, most often, almost always, agreed with the board. Um, and if you get to a certain threshold, 75%, the scheme becomes binding on all shareholders. Meaning... If you have 25%, you can block any scheme of arrangement you want. Well, 25.1%, but essentially you can block any bid to take the company. So you only own 25% because the threshold to acquire a company in a scheme is so high, you can block it. You can block any deal you don't want. Now, there is another way to take over a company in the UK. That's via a takeover. Um, which is not binding. And therefore you could make the argument, well, if someone really wants to buy Serica in the future, they could just buy 51% that they'd have control. Actually, that would not, that would be technically control, but they would not, it would still be very difficult to operate the company that way because if you have such a large minority shareholder, you could requisition meetings of the board. You could, um, you could stop any squeeze out of the company. You could cause all kinds of red tape for the actual operation of the company. Um, so realistically, if Mercuria accedes to a 25% look-through position in the company, you're essentially never going to be able to sell the company to anyone else that Mercuria says no to. Now, why is that important? Because Mercuria is not just a financial buyer. Mercuria is a large trading house that has interests that go far beyond Serica. In fact, they had their own marketing and hedging relationships with the Tailwind Energy. Tailwind Energy is an ENP, upstream business. But Mercuria itself is actually much larger and has far more wide-ranging interests. So Mercuria, if anyone wants to buy Serica's assets, if Mercuria doesn't like it, if they compete in any way with Mercuria in these other lines of business, they'll just say no. And because of that very fact, of course, Serica equity will trade with a discount because there is no, post this transaction, there will be low or almost no ability to get a fair market price for the asset. Like, Let's say Mercuria moved to a 25% stake. And let's say that I got really, really upset with the future of the company and I built up my shares and I owned, you know, 20% or 30%, even a very large holding. And I, I managed to get the company to run a process to sell. Wouldn't matter. Serica could just block it if they didn't like it. So the only potential buyer for this company after Mercuria moves to 25% is essentially Mercuria or one of Mercury's buddies or whoever that is. And yeah. do you think you're going to get a paid a fair market price in that situation? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, and, and, and one of if the you problems don't believe, for me. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, one of the problems for me here is for me, there are two problems here. The first one is, as you said, you know, if you want Mercury to get the control, they need to pay a premium. This is not happening. Yeah. Is the other way around. In fact, you are paying a premium to buy them so they get the control, which which is something that again the governance is so poor, you know. It's just yep. UK style, to be honest, in, in finance. And then the second one is that one of the things that you say there uh, about the minorities are holders having the risk of being subordinated. What we need to understand here is that Mercuria is not like Kistos, right? Kistos is a company and there are no other interests around Kistos. The problem yep. with Mercuria is that Mercuria is a huge company, like the the the, the parent company of Mercuria. So uh, Serica for them is nothing. So are we sure that they are going to be looking in the best interest of Serica and Serica uh, shareholders, or they will use it to get the business bigger on the on their parent company? You know, so this is also a very huge risk that you can you can have there. 
and that you also need to consider. Not saying that they will do it. Maybe they will do it. Maybe they won't. But is there a risk? There is that you need to consider. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, look, Mercuria is not a public company. I'm not privy to their financials. So I, I cannot sit here and tell you how big Serica's... Look, they'll own 25% of Serica if this deal goes through. I am not in a position to say that 25% equity stake is so small to be irrelevant to Mercuria. I think there are many other business lines and you know they're a very large organization. So I assume they have competing interests, but I'm not able to say that definitively. But what you're saying is absolutely correct. When you make a company changing transaction like this, you shouldn't be in a position to to put yourself at risk like this. And I would also say that in the public domain, there are tons of other transactions that have looked and smelt like this and ended very, very badly for, minor for minority shareholders. So for example, if your uh, 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 followers are looking adventurous, they could pull up the chart of a company called Naranda Income Fund, NIF. It's listed in Canada. It's a zinc smelter where Glencore, you know, the big Glencore trading yeah. house, owns 25%. Exactly the same. They own 25%, but they also have these commercial relationships with Naranda where they sell zinc concentrate to the smelter and they have an offtake agreement where they buy the finished product. So basically it's managed and controlled by Glencore, even though they have 25%. Very similar kind of situation. Then there are other examples where um, Turquoise Hill, TRQ, famous company listed in Canada where um, Rio Tinto owned yep. a, a majority, a very small majority stake. And essentially had management control, did a lot of business, had inside information, and eventually ended up screwing minorities over and over and over again. Not quite analogous to this because they did have more of an equity stake, but again, similar. There's lots of other examples I could point to where minorities have a large shareholder with which they have related the related party transactions between that large shareholder and the operating company. And despite you know management claiming at the time the relationship is established, no, 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 we'll have arm's length, we'll have fair dealing, et cetera, et cetera. In the end, the subject company always gets screwed and it ends badly. Like if you pull up a chart of Noranda or Turquoise Hill, Turquoise Hill underperformed for a decade before Glencore took it out at a very low price. Noranda Income Fund, horrible equity performance before now Glencore is trying to take it out at a very cheap price. Same thing happens all over. So, it always yeah. ends. When they always, do that and they want to do that, always end the same way. You know, there's they always take that the temptation. Assets, they, there's a temptation, yeah. right? Yeah, they take the asset, they take everything. They don't care, of course, about the, the market price. And then when it's so low, they just buy it for cheap, you know. Exactly. It does tend to happen. So that's a risk that you're creating if you do this transaction, which I don't think many people are discussing or thinking about. Okay. And now this point that for me is, is also key, you know, like one, one of the strong things that they defend is that they provide data on a per share basis, right? So they yep. are saying that the deal is secretive. Do you have any doubt that the deal is secretive? Yeah, it's 14, it's 23%, whatever, right? But like one of the things that you said here is for me is completely key, you know, like you not use per share metrics on these kind of companies that have so much cash, like Serica, and when you are acquiring one that is leveraged, like Tailwind. That's right. Know? So that, that is ridiculous. I mean, you, you need to do everything compared to the enterprise value, right? And That's right. they completely refused at all to do it. Why? Because the numbers are not looking that great. Look, I would, this, this is simple. Like if the deal was good, they, I mean, this is, this is so obvious, this point, I can't believe it really needs to be said, but apparently it does. Like when they were pressed, when management was pressed on this transaction, first of all, these per share metrics they come up with, none of this was in the original presentation of the deal. None of it. It only came later when they updated the market after there'd been some pushback. So if you look at when the deal was announced, it had no discussion of per share accretion. Then there was a lot of indignation from people like me and you. And all of a sudden, the next presentation a month later, they said, well, on an earnings per share basis, on an operating cash flow per share basis, on a 2P per share basis, um, this is 14 to 20 something percent accretive. Isn't it such a great deal? But your point is absolutely correct. If you buy anything with leverage, anything, if you buy it with enough leverage, it can be made to look accretive, right? Because debt doesn't show up in EPS. And of course, if the, if the acquiring entity has massive cash, which of course Serica does here, 60, 65% of the market cap is cash, then it goes both ways. You're buying something with leverage and you're also giving up your net cash to do it, but the EPS per share is 
is just as is. It's not on an X cash basis, right? So when they say, well, standalone Serica would make 85 pence a share, which by the way, I think is wrong. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> Serica is going to make 85%. They don't tell you it's 85 per share plus the cash they have today, which is 165 per share. So realistic value is 165 plus some multiple of that earning stream. Instead, they just say, no, 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 EPS is going to go up from 85 to 95 or 100, whatever it is. But they don't tell you that the cash per share is going to go down from 165 to 60, right? You're going to lose 100 pence per share in cash during this deal. So if you do that math, obviously the deal is either not accretive or, as, you know, even giving them credit, modestly accretive. Um, yeah, and, and but... I mean, the numbers that you have there <laughs> below, you know, when you're speaking about those 90p per share. So, uh, okay. So yes, yes you sorry, have those 90... I, can, I can unpack that. I can unpack that yeah. for everyone. It's it a little bit detailed. So yeah. essentially, if they do this deal, Serica will be swapping 460 million of net cash, which equates to 160, 165 pence per share today for... Uh, for going from 460 million net cash to 124 million net cash. That change is the difference between the debt they acquire at Tailwind and the cash they pay for the asset. So they're paying 59 million cash out. They're acquiring 277 million of, uh, of Tailwind's debt. So that's the 336 million. And they're also issuing 111 million new shares, right? So the, the difference in net cash pre and post this deal is 336 million. 336 million divided by the share count is about 90 pence per share. Now, in return for giving up 90 cents share of cash net net, what are we getting? We're getting 10 cents, 10 pence in extra earnings per share. That's if if we believe management's forecast, which we'll come to. But And again, th this is not like forever because these assets, this is just based on 2P and they're wasting. So it's not as if we have, you know, unlimited time to earn 10 pence a share year in, year out, every year. Now, why in oil and gas would you ever trade 90 cents of cash for 10 cents of earnings, especially when the acquired earnings you're getting in this case are what, what, what is a, the 2P reserves of Tailwind's assets are what, six or seven years. So well less than the payback period. But when your own equity trades at two times free cash flow, one and a half times in income, it's just absolutely ridiculous. You're paying essentially nine or 10 times price earnings, call it, call it nine times, be generous. When your own equity is trading at one and a half times, two times, maybe, depending on your gas price or something. So it's, it really boggles your mind. And the idea, I mean, the, the other point to make is the very fact that management chose to portray it like this. In other words, they didn't even try. And as you said, do an enterprise value methodology or an EV to 2P. Or, they didn't even try to give an accurate picture. Means they know they can't defend it honestly. They, no, they can't. The, the financial, the numbers just aren't there, right? If the numbers are there, it's easy to say, well, this is accretive on an enterprise value basis, because we'd be buying something at five dollars per barrel of two p or whatever. But they're not. They yeah. can't because that you know it's pretty obvious. So instead, they try to confuse you and to to shove it down our throats by blatant misleading portrayal of of the information. When in reality, it may be accretive on earnings per share or cash flow per share. But it's not accretive. In fact, it's decretive on a total value basis. That's the key. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And what you said there, you know, it's like if you are paying like nine times, you know, uh, doing that comparison, including the cash and enterprise value, et cetera, you know, you are paying nine times for those extra profits, but your your company is trading at 1.5 free cash flow times yes. you know so it's like honestly you can defend that you are paying nine times for this when you can just buy yourself because don't, don't forget that it's not only like doing a tender but they already have approved a report chase program so they can be by buying shares today you know i mean they don't need to do That's anything right. more than go to the broker and say buy three million for example you know yeah so they can do that at 1.5 uh, cash flow times. They have 60 to 70% of net cash there to do it, you know. And and it's one thing that for me is crazy is that we have been waiting for any kind of deal of Serica for such a long time and they did nothing, you know. We were waiting for a raising in the dividends and they did nothing. We were waiting mm -hmm. for buybacks and they did nothing, you know. So when they are waiting that much, you expect that they come, you know, because you have been waiting for that long, they come with something really good, 
you know, like, look, this is an amazing deal. You are putting here, I don't know, like 50,000 barrels. You know, the price is so cheap, yeah. you know, like this is not, I mean, nobody can say that this is an amazing deal. You know, like what, what we have here in front of us is amazing. I mean, there is no way to defend that. Sorry. And even like the people that is defending the deal, the only thing that they are saying is that in their view, it's accretive. Nobody's saying like, this is a steal of a deal, you know? Yeah. I totally agree. It's it's highly disappointing. I mean, management kind of soft guided. They didn't guide, but they kind of implied when they rejected the Kistos deal. I heard from numerous investors that management would return 100 pence. So a good chunk of the net cash in a special dividend at year end. That was kind of the way they defended not saying yes to Kistos. And then here we are. It's the complete opposite. No returns, no, no increase in dividends, no buybacks, just this kind of terrible deal. The the only people who have uh, defended this deal, as you say, are those who said, well, look, there's value in the tax assets, as we discussed. It's highly questionable. Maybe there's some value there, but you can't bank on it. And the other point they said is, well, they do get into oil, which is much less risky than gas. But at this price, at this kind of destructive price, uh, I, I totally disagree. I don't think it, it would be far less risky to retire shares. Than to, to than to take on that kind of risk, irrespective of your view on the commodity prices. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, of course, you can be more or less aggressive. You know, like uh, you can push more for like retiring more or using more than net cash. You know, but what you cannot see it is like in such huge pile of cash just for the sake of having cash and now just throw it away. You know, in fact, one totally. of the key parts of the merger with Kistos is that what Andrew was saying is like part of all this cash needs to go to the shareholders. You know. Because yep. don't forget yep. that uh, the merger with Kistos, yeah, you have it there in the in this. Like, let's just speak now about those alternatives, you know, and, and starting with the one on Kistos. Sure. From all the money that they were looking to pay, more than two hundred p was in cash for the shareholders, right? Yep. So the yep. the value there was huge. And when you speak about the premiums, they rejected uh, the the Kistos uh, merge because they said that they were undervaluing Serica, but they are paying like between what you have there, between 30 and 40% premium, the way that you look it for the current price that they uh, closed the deal with Mercuria. Now giving yep. to Mercuria the control of the company, you know, on top of that. Exactly. So, I mean, like how you can defend that, that the Kistos deal was a bad deal, but the Mercuria deal giving them the control, paying way less is a good deal. It's look, I totally agree. It's interesting that they didn't really try to. I mean, on the call discussing the Mercuria deal, I never heard a con coherent answer as to why this deal is superior to the Kistos deal. I don't even think they tried defending it. The numbers are just so. I mean, the only thing they would say is they would just reiterate the strength, the, the supposed strategic rationale for the Mercuria deal, for the Tailwind deal, which, as you said, makes no sense. Like you could have effectively delivered a 41% premium to your shareholders and instead, and by the way, taking out more than half of the share price today in cash, right? Taking out a lot of the share price in cash. So de-risking the outcome for you essentially, and still leaving you with control of the, of the merged company, right? So you take out 213 pence per share versus the stock price at the time uh, was basically two thirds of the equity. And then you still get control 58% of the pro forma merged entity. So you still get to see what Serica merged with Kistos could become in terms of a go forward business versus now you're giving, <laughs> you're giving effective control of the company when your equity is trading at one and a half times free cash flow uh, to, to the enterprise. Um, and you're striking the said equity issuance at 278 versus the 425 you would have gotten. It's absolutely insane. Um, and again, speaks to your point about governance and, and kind of vested interests and how it's um, it's a kind of a rigged a rigged situation from that perspective. But I mean, let's talk also about the accelerated tender for the company because yeah. I think I think this is also kind of interesting. Look, I, I just kind of came up with this scenario. This is not saying this is the exact right structure or the exact right quantities, but just for example, they're spending all this cash to acquire. Uh, essentially, they're they're going from four sixty million net cash to one twenty four million net cash in this tailwind deal, right? So essentially they're willing to go down to a, a, a lower, a much lower net cash position, as makes sense. There's no way you need all this cash. So instead of spending that 335 million, let's say they spent 350 million, about the same amount. And let's yep. say you tended for all of the shares at a, at a premium, 300 pence. So a big premium to where we trade, call it 10, 15% premium to the current share price. 
you could retire a hell of a lot of the company, maybe not 43%, to be honest, but let's say they gave it a try or you just bought shares in the market over time. The point is it so far and away blows out the uh, accretion numbers that management is now offering you that it's just a no-brainer, right? So if management's saying, well, if we do this deal, earnings per share will be 14% accretive. You know, 2P per share will be 20% accretive. Well, if you do this buyback, you'll have exactly the same share position and all your per share metrics will improve by 75%, 75%, five to seven times better than this silly deal with no risk. I mean, that's, that's the whole point about this, this other business we'll talk about tailwind in a second is I actually think there's a decent amount of risk. I mean, any kind of upstream business entails risk, yep. but given how, how little has been disclosed about tailwind's operating performance, um, there's obviously more risk than there normally is. And the fact they rushed the deal through just at Christmas, all these things are risks, right? But doing this financial engineering, there is no risk. It's literally, you know, the, the assets you operate are exactly the same as you currently have. You're simply optimizing your balance sheet, doing the best thing for shareholders. It's literally a no-brainer. And I can't understand why they, where they, they don't see it that way. Well, I do understand, but I just really disagree with it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And and as you said, maybe you're not retiring the 43%, but even the question, I mean, you can do another kind of math, right? That is like when they are speaking about that kind of per share metrics. And, and I think that they were speaking about what? Like, let me go back, 14 to 23%. You could take yes. like how much cash you need to uh, spend to get 15% accretive, you know, like doing a tender on 300p. And that would be a very interesting number because it's just not that much cash, right? Exactly, exactly. You could take these numbers that I put there and you could haircut them in half, right? And you would still have a double or triple the outcome that they're offering through this deal. That's how much of a distance there is between the two outcomes. That's, that's my point. Even if you had to pay up to 325, right? And even if you didn't get 40% of the company, you only got 30%, 25% you'd still have EPS accretion double offered by this yeah. deal with zero risk. So it's such a no-brainer. That's my point. You don't have to execute the transaction right at those exact levels to see that it's a better option for all shareholders. And an interesting part also that you said is not only that you are adding value like per share metrics for the company, but probably you are raising the price for everyone, you know? Like, because if you do a huge tender, or you start being very aggressive on, on buybacks, the share price is not going to be in 270. You know, sure. I mean, probably they will, they can easily go back to, let's say, 400, you know, if you have a plan where you are being clear about buybacks, et cetera, you know, so it's, it's just I, I, something that I is agree. clearly I, easier. Look, As you said, there is I, no operational risk, you know, like there is no one rig that is going bad, you know, one well that is not working. You had a problem in North Sea, the price is going down, you know, I mean, you, you are taking all that all those factors that are really relevant in an oil and gas company, you are taking all of those out. Absolutely. And to your point about raising the price of your own currency, look, you're trading at $6 a barrel. There is a huge discount, rightly so, embedded in that price for risk of bad capital allocation. Now we see why with this horrendous deal. If you remove that discount and your stock trades at, say, $12, $15 a barrel, guess what? Then you can go back to Mercurio or, or any other potential counterparty and you have a reasonable basis for a negotiation. If your own equity is trading at $15 a barrel and you buy something at $20 a barrel and you think there's synergies, look, there's no complaint. I would maybe say it's a reasonable deal. Maybe I would like it. Maybe I wouldn't, but there'd definitely be, you could have a reasonable discussion. When your own equity is trading where it is and you're still issuing so much of it to fund a deal at a crazy price, it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense okay so uh, just to finalize one of the last ones here and I don't know if you want to speak a bit about that one before closing yeah I mean look this is just this is just to demonstrate that when when management's uh, discussing the potential accretion right they in, if you actually look at the bottom of the deck they give you their price assumptions so their gas price assumptions in pence per therm for the next year or next two three years and then they say that Seric would only earn, you know, 80, 80 pence. But even with the new tax regime, if we actually saw those prices that they assume, I think the, the profitability of the business would be much, much, much higher. So my, my point here is just that they've given you these disclosures around what price they're using and what costs they're assuming for the business in, say, the next two or three years. But then they're only saying the core business is going to make 80 pence. I think it'll make a lot more than that. That's all. 
Um, I think I think the more interesting thing to discuss, or at least the more important thing to discuss, is actually on the the tailwind business in terms of the the operating cadence of those assets, because management has suggested there's a strong strategic rationale and that the tailwind business is growing rapidly and is very attractive. I'm not saying that's entirely wrong. I'm saying there's a lot more risk than that portrayal implies. What I mean by that is if you look at the disclosures, I'm not sure if I talked about it in the letter, but if you look at the disclosures, Tailwind Energy was only producing 11, 12,000 barrels a day in January of 2022. Okay. Then they had some development success and they brought on a number of new wells. And all of a sudden they were exiting the year at 24, 25,000 barrels a day. However, if you then look at the guidance for 23, 24, 25, they're only implying that Tailwind will produce 18, 18 and a half thousand barrels a day versus Serica, which they've guided to basically flat production for the next three, three and a half years at around 25,000 barrels a day. So the point is Tailwind has been a bit of a roller coaster. It was 11,000 barrels a day at the beginning of 2022. It dropped down massively to mid single digits thousands in mid year due to some maintenance, other field issues. Uh, and then they brought on a few new wells that are flowing very aggressively. However, the implied assumption is there'll be a rapid decline of those new wells because they're saying production, even though it's been better than expected recently, the implied number in the guidance is it's going to fall off, you know, from current run rates about 20, 25%, more than 25%, which is pretty substantial versus our existing assets are basically very stable. Yeah. So my only point is this transaction is all about risk. You're swapping, uh, you're swapping a very, very cheap currency for a much more expensive equity. Okay, you're swapping a fast growing but undoubtedly riskier uh, uh, suite of producing assets versus your own extremely stable, more predictable suite of producing assets. And you're doing it all at the wrong price. So you're increasing financial leverage, you're increasing operating leverage, you're giving away control, and you're not getting paid for it. Not only that, there are a number of other alternatives that exist to this transaction, whether they be merger with strategic partners or whether they be financial engineering and balance sheet optimization, both of which would create a huge amount more value than this transaction. So that's why for me, this is a no brainer vote against. And, um, oh yeah, so that you just pointed there are no operational synergies. I mean, yeah, this is the last the slide that I have. Yeah. They don't operate the same because one's oil and gas, one, one's oil basically and one's gas. They were both in the North Sea, but other than that, you know, so what? You know, it's not as if they're contiguous fields, meaning the two fields are next to each other. They're different basins, essentially. Um, and the extant business, Serica, is not subscale, right? It's already 25, 26,000 barrels a day. That's, yeah, that for me is course. key. You know, I mean, if yeah, you I are, mean, I don't know, imagine that you are 2,000 barrels. Okay, yeah, of course, you you have some some costs, you know, on, on like oh. your office in London, those kind of things, you know, and you need to, to get bigger, but they are already really, really big. And, and you know, you know, there is no benefit to scale because the cost assumption is unchanged. So even though they're guiding, they're going from 25,000 barrels to 45,000 run rate, the cost per barrel is the same. It's still going to be $17, $18 a barrel OPEX. So there's zero synergy. So, okay, you're, you're, you're adding production, but for what? And you're adding that production, as we discussed, <laughs> at triple the price for your own equity trades. So why? Just so, so it does, doesn't make sense. Like this whole argument around scale, whatever, if you're going to make that argument, why wouldn't you at least go with the Kistos deal? That was far better for shareholders. That was the same commodity. And there was a, at least the rationale that you're applying here is almost identical. Get scale, same North Sea operator, create a, get, create a, you know, a larger, a larger entity that would move up the ranks in terms of independence, become more investable, become a better platform for acquisitions. But your shareholders are getting 45% more. What's the big deal? Oh, well, you, you wouldn't be able to run the company. That's why. So it's, yeah. it's kind of rights itself. Yeah, and, and I have the last sentence that you have there that in fact is from the first uh, is page that you have or, or the second one. But, but I think it's a very good summary. You know, like <clears throat> I think that for me also, I agree with you that it's clear that for current shareholders, they are destroying a lot of value here. That, that value is coming into Mercuria, you know, at very different levels, not just an economic level, but also on the on the control that we discuss, you know, and also that value is coming to Serica's management because they are assuring their role there and that they will continue there, you know. So the problem there is that, you know, the question is like, imagine that the CEO is having 15% of Serica, 
do you honestly think that he would go ahead with this deal? I mean, we know that no, for sure, because he would be making three million a year, you know, in, in, in with her, his salary, and he would be losing two hundred million or one hundred million with this deal, you know. So he wouldn't go ahead. Would you imagine that Andrew would be going ahead with this deal in Kistos? with 20 percent of the company, for sure, no. Yep. yep. So yeah, uh, I I think this yep. is. I think you summarized it nicely, Copy. And yeah. thank you again for having me on. It was great to um, to exchange views with you, and um, hopefully we can um, we can encourage more shareholders to voice their views to management, and ultimately with their vote, tell management this is not acceptable. Yeah, I, I guess that people at least uh, I would like them to see the video, and then they can they can think up you know for themselves, and then they can decide if they decide that is yes, it's fine. If they decide yes. that it's no, it's fine. But for me, it was a moral duty, honestly to do this because it's yet another governance shit show, you know, in UK. And and there is a point where you need to say enough is enough, you know? So totally, so, totally. The yeah, UK is, is kind of yeah. corporate governance has just left that market behind. It's deal after yeah. deal. I mean, there's a few other deals that maybe we'll talk about offline that are maybe not as bad as this. This is really egregious. This is really unbelievably horrendous, but there's, it does happen frequently in the UK and they really need to try to figure it out because there's a lot of poor minority shareholders who are getting taken advantage of. Absolutely. Well, Jeremy, I know that you have things to do. I have things to do here, you in Japan and myself here in, in London. So thank you very much for your time. We will stay in touch and hopefully... My pleasure. Things go Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias y que tengas un buen día. Muchas gracias, Jeremy. Take care. Bye. <laughs> have a great day.